I see a few more people trickling in, but it looks like maybe we're getting pretty close. Um, I don't know, uh, people who are just joining, if you're just joining and you need to access the um, the uh, closed captioning, Emma from HDC has put something in the chat for accessing that. So feel free to look there. All right, I think if it looks good to everybody else, I think we can go ahead and jump in. Um, I'm not seeing anyone pop up in the waiting room, so I think we're good to go. Welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're hoping to have a really great conversation today about how to look at affordable housing a little differently than we frequently do. Um, we have a short presentation to get us started and I'm gonna share my screen. And then after that, we're going to open up to Q&A and hope to have just a really great conversation. So let me get my screen up and running. There we go. Is everybody seeing that? Oop. Let's see here. All right. Again, welcome and thank you to HDC for hosting and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, with us, we have Michael Winkler Chin, who is Executive Director of the Seattle Chinatown International District Preservation Development Authority, or better known as SCIPDA. Joel Ng with Edge Developers, who played a pivotal role in securing funding for North Lot. Andy Burnham, who is the manager, or manager of Energy Services at Rushing and she is the key person who ensured we complied with HDC's exemplary building program. And I'm Maggie Carson with Weber Thompson. I was the lead designer on the project and will act as moderator for today's conversation. We're gonna get started off with a quick presentation, like I mentioned, um, and then open it up to Q&A after that. We have everyone muted at the moment, but please feel free to use the chat box and Zoom to ask questions that you'd like the team to answer. And with that, I'm actually gonna uh, hand it over to Maiko to get us started. Hi, everybody. Uh, that front photo is not what I look like nowadays in COVID. So uh, if you're expecting to see that face, you're not going to see her anytime soon. Um, I have the pleasure of working for the Seattle Chinatown International District Preservation and Development Authority. And we are developing a project uh, that is called North Lot. Uh, there'll be a fancier name at some point, I'm sure, which is located on the North Lot of the Pacific Hospital or Pacific Tower which is a Pacific Hospital Public Development Authority's land right up there uh, above Chinatown on North Beacon Hill. Um, on this slide, you will see a little black mark with a circle around it, and that is the location of the site. And you'll see uh, on these three maps um, some things that are really important to us in our work here at the PDA. Um, one uh, is the provision of affordable housing. And if you look, there's a lot of people that are cost burdened that live around uh, the site. The second is an issue of displacement. Uh, we, uh, the project and our uh, neighborhood that we work in is um, high on the list of displacement factors. We're a high opportunity area, but with that comes the risk of being high displacement. Um, the third piece that we didn't really think about until we were working on this project and was presented with data was the environmental exposures. So if you look on this map, you'll see that we are in an area with high environmental issues to contend with. And um, if you take all that into consideration, it makes us, uh, there's a lot of equity issues to consider as we build our housing here at this site. Maggie, next slide, please. So a little bit about the PDA. Um, we uh, wanted to do family size units and we wanted to do that because uh, in our portfolio, we have one building that is all two and three bedrooms. And you see some of the data that's represented here from that. Um, in the two building, uh, the, that building in particular that has all the two and three bedroom units has been around for 17 years. And in looking at our, um, the data from that, 73% of the residents living in that building stay more than six years versus an average tenancy and market rate buildings of 27 months. 
And I think the average tenancy in affordable housing is about seven years. So our people stay a long time in, in those units. 22% um, of the residents stay uh, 15 plus years. That, that's all that we know at this point because the building is, is uh, 17 years old. 19% um, of the residents in that unit size are 61 and older and 34% of the residents in um, that property are 17 years or younger. And that skews a little bit differently from the general Chinatown population that we serve uh, in that uh, about 45% of the residents in our general population are 61 and older. And it's about 17% or 17 years and younger in our general population. But that makes sense because you have family size units. Uh, when we were looking at the housing project, we did have a desire to uh, increase the number of two and three bedroom units just because uh, that for us has been a very successful building and it allows us a lot of opportunity in serving our community. We wanted to collaborate with partners who support the same mission, which was actually to serve the community um, by providing the services that they need in a location that's very convenient and uh, important for them. Um, and we wanted to provide a healthy environment and uh, that became apparent over time. So our partners in the project are El Centro de la Raza. They'll be providing on-site childcare um, and uh, a program called Aging in Pace Washington, which is a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. So the seniors can come there, receive the care that they need, but then at the end of the day, they go back to the communities in which they live, which are really, really important for them and allow them to stay connected with their family and their community. Next slide, please. Turning it over I got a little, to Maggie. Yeah. Yep, I got a little button click happy there. Um, most of you are probably at least aware of this site, even if you don't know it. The project's located at the far north end of Beacon Hill overlooking the CID, and it's part of the Pacific Tower campus. It sits directly north of the tower itself. If you've ever driven south on I-5 and then turned onto 90, you've definitely noticed it before because of how that tower really sits so distinctively perched up on the hill. This project can, consists of two buildings, which are mostly residential. Building A, which is closer to the tower, has commercial use at the base, which is where the AI Pace Senior Center and the El Centro Early Learning Center are gonna be located. And you can see those commercial uses indicated by the shades of orange on that plan and axon. The remainder of the project is affordable housing and residential amenity spaces. One of the unique things about this project is the abundance of multi-bedroom units. More than 50% of the units have two or more bedrooms with over 20% of those actually having three or four bedrooms. And this unit mix really accommodates families like few other large developments in the city do. Oftentimes, multi-bedroom units are relegated to the corners of floor plans. And this is because you need more frontage to allow for a window into every bedroom. And the corner position really provides that additional frontage. In order to achieve more bedrooms throughout the whole project and still maintain efficiency, we needed to create a strategy that used less length of frontage. And you can see that the floor plan is notched along most of the facades in that, that lower plan there. And that's it's in those notches where we're able to actually add the windows for the bedroom without the typical length that would be required. And that's how we are able to get so many multi-bedroom units in there. It's harder for individuals to have privacy when more people share an apartment. So when you have larger families living together in one unit, you also need more amenity space as well. Between the two buildings and the center courtyard is a collective green space for residents, including a large lawn, as well as patios with tables and chairs. Also the El Centro play space, space is located here, so it can easily be, easily be shared between residents um, and the daycare. Inside the building, we've created a hub of shared space on every residential floor. These spaces work together to provide areas for socializing with neighbors. It includes a lounge room with a TV, a library room, a laundry room with small seating area and folding table. And there's also some seating um, by the elevators. While these rooms are for everyone, they especially are great for teams to socialize or have a quiet place to study, which isn't always readily available in a family apartment. All these spaces together really amplify family apartment living as well as build community within the project. As we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, um, the relationship between the housing crisis and the environmental crisis really amplifies inequity for families needing affordable housing. 
Naively, I like to think of Seattle as a fairly clean big city, but in reality, we are like most large cities and our air quality reflects that, uh, with areas closest to the high density traffic really suffering the most. Located at the interchange of I-5 and I-90, the north end of Beacon Hill and the CID are heavily affected. Exposure to air pollution has both short-term and long-term effects on people, and over time, these effects add strain to our healthcare system and increase inequities in education performance. So combating the environmental crisis was necessary to properly serve the community and really the city as a whole. And with that, we're going to get into the HDC exemplary building portion of this, and I'll hand it over to Andy. Thanks, Maggie. Um, I'm sure that everyone has seen this chart or some version of it um, a minimum of 10 times. Uh, you know, the, the key thing here is why are we talking about energy use of buildings? Why do we care? Building operational energy accounts for, you know, in the range of 40% of the energy consumed in the US. That's a really big uh, a really big chunk of where the energy is going. And that's why we really need to focus on uh, the impacts that our buildings have. That's a really big part of the climate change story. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the HDC Exemplary Building Program? It's all about ultra efficient, affordable housing. Um, some of the key aspects of this program include, uh, you know, prioritizing integrated design on the right side. Um, I'm sure this is another graphic everyone's seen some version of the McLeamy, the McLeamy uh, curve where you're not necessarily spending more effort, you're just shifting the effort earlier in the design um, in order to optimize the impact and outcome prior to when changes get more expensive um, and harder to implement. Um, other aspects of this are energy and water, water modeling to really optimize the designs for energy and water. Um, part of that energy is checking one of these three energy boxes, a sub 20 EUI, which is an energy usage intensity. That's a measurement of how much energy the building is consuming per square foot. So it allows us to compare buildings meaningfully that are of different sizes, um, or a 50% reduction in the Washington State Energy Code baseline, or meeting a passive house um, certification. So this project chose to design to a 20 EUI target, energy usage intensity. And um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, a big piece of that is where is, does the energy go in a multifamily affordable housing project? You can see that top right energy pie is the two really big pieces there are the blue domestic water heating and the red space heating. So when you look at the chart below that, that's, that's the North Lot proposed design. And you can see that we're spending about half as much energy as a typical kind of minimally code compliant affordable housing uh, or any multifamily project. Um, and you can see how much smaller those blue and red slices of the pie have gotten. And that's through use of heat pump technology. Um, that's a really efficient way to provide heating for both water and, um, and space heating use. Um, for the space heating, we're still doing electric heat in the units, but we're utilizing uh, energy recovery ventilators, ERVs. So the pivot that I'm going to make on this pie chart is again, you know, the topic of our discussion today is more than a unit count. It's all about rethinking metrics and rethinking from just how do we check the right boxes to get to this energy goal and thinking more holistically about the outcome of the project design. If we can go to the next slide. We're going to talk a little bit more about this decision to utilize ERVs, energy recovery ventilators, for the project. Going back to the previous discussions about the site, the location, uh, concerns about air quality given the um, multi generational occupancy of the project. Um, you know, this technology is a ventilation system that has ducted outside air intake and exhaust, where we do some energy heat recovery from the incoming and outgoing air. So it's very energy efficient, but there's a lot of other project benefits, including we now have filtration on the outside air coming in. Um, I don't know if everyone remembers the smoke from wildfires over the last few wildfire seasons and summers. This now, instead of people needing to open their windows or count on trickle vent openings, we've now got filters inside of our ventilation system uh, that we can 
we can utilize to increase our air quality. It also means that we're not counting on those trickle vents being open and we're reducing street noise and acoustic impacts in the units. Um, as well as, you know, it allows us to increase our um, ability to maintain building pressurization control because we're not counting on those operable um, windows, the trickle vent openings for the ventilation and people, act, you know, maybe close them and now there's not a, a clear intake air path. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to this system beyond just energy. And I think this really highlights the design team's approach to thinking beyond um, the base metric and thinking holistically throughout the project design. Maggie, you're muted. Thanks. I'm glad you told me. <laughs> um, as we all know, affordable housing really isn't going away in the near future. And to Andy's point, our big takeaway throughout this project has been how important it is to look beyond just simple statistics like cost per unit or even the EUI, because there are so many other important factors not captured in those metrics specifically. Um, those metrics really can't qualify the value of providing a healthier building for residents in the city. They can't really qualify the value of families staying in their community near their support networks. And they can't really qualify the value in less resident turnover or family stability. And so we really think it's important to look at the big picture as we continue to design and fund affordable housing projects. And so with that, we're going to open up to questions. I'm going to do a little screen shuffling, stop sharing, um, and see who has added some questions to the chat. Um, we did get a couple of questions right before, too. And so let's start off with um, projects often face pressure to create high unit counts and therefore small units in order to secure funding. What was the main argument to lenders that got the project past this hurdle? And what roadblocks to funding do you wish you could remove that more projects or so that more projects like North Lot would be possible? And this is probably a good question for both Joel and Maiko. Um, so either Joel or Maiko, feel free to take it away. I can start. I, I, I can't see the, the question in the chat box, but I'll try to remember what you just said. So this, this project, um, for those that don't know, I think some may know, was a project that was promoted by the former Speaker of the House. And so um, he had invested quite largely in, in the Pacific Medical Building. So uh, his idea was to provide affordable housing. And, and really, one strong tenant of his is that it remains affordable in perpetuity. Uh, there were different thoughts initially that was going to be a mixed income project between the two. So once it became an all affordable, um, this is a very large campus and it's, it's almost a suburban campus in an urban, in an urban area, right smack in the middle of the city, right smack at the intersection of 90 and I-5. Um, and so there's a lot of costs involved. I mean, there just, there just are. Uh, one thing is it is two phases. Um, I think we mentioned that in the beginning. So Phase one is shouldering uh, a number of the costs for the entire campus. Um, but the other thing, and I can let Michael kind of complete what she was saying earlier, is in addition to the size of the campus and, and the costs associated is really the target of and the mission of the PDA, of Skipta in this, in this sense. Um, she had mentioned, and, and I've seen it throughout, is the large bedrooms is something that we've heard, but when it comes to funding, when we say beyond a, a unit count, oftentimes we look at what is the cost per unit. That's just kind of a quick number that we look at. But I think what they, what they the funders heard when we said it is number one, um, this is a highly polluted area, not just from, from the traditional pollution, but from noise pollution that's in the flight path. The other thing is the large units uh, the number of residents that stay for a long time. So the operating costs as well uh, tend to be lower because the turnovers and everything else that happen. And so from the overall kind of messaging, the PDA really stayed firm to that. And we didn't get funding the first time. Um, we were denied. And so we had to go back like many other developers, but we did not change our 
focus. Uh, sometimes we chase the criteria. We stay firm to the, the mission. And, and I'll end there and I can add more later if need be. But Michael, was there anything else? I guess I would just add that um, family size use units is something that the PDA has really been talking about for, I was going to say the past 10 years, but I feel like it's been a lot longer than that. It might be closer to 20. When you get older, uh, years kind of float on by. Um, and we've been consistent with that. And over time, we've seen some of the policies, especially in the city of Seattle, change. So, you know, the uh, comprehensive plan back in the mid 20 teens really started talking about gentrification and displacement and areas of high opportunity and high displacement risk. And we were seeing that. The other thing that we noticed uh, is in the last levy funding for the Office of Housing, uh, family size units became a priority for them. And although that may not be a priority across all the different funders, it was for the city. So we finally felt like it was, oh, some, somebody might be listening just a little bit to us. And so it wasn't a chasing of our, um, of what we're saying, we're just being consistent. And it's something that the PDA board has uh, put out as our focus. So from that perspective, it was helpful. Um, actually having a building that is a family, you know, family size units and, and the success there was also helpful for us. Great. Yeah, this is great insight into that. Um, we have a few more questions popping in. One of them, did licensing suggest that the outdoor preschool play space uh, was allowed to be shared with the building residents? Um, did you need prior approval for that? Michael shaking her head. Um, go um, ahead. We have a couple of projects that have childcare in them. And I don't think the licensor is ever going to be like, dude, have you ever thought about allowing your families to come and play? It's something that we had to have the childcare <laughs> provider ask. And uh, we had to come up with uh, plans to mitigate their concerns about the cleanliness. So we have another project that's um, hopefully under construction soon. And we have a similar situation of a shared, uh, of a shared childcare space because it would be kind of awful to be running a property with a lovely play area that your children aren't allowed to play in. So um, over the weekend, the kids in the housing get to play with it. And then our staff have to come up and clean it uh, and pick up around there before the child care center opens the next day. And that's the agreement that we have to have um, with the child care center on that space. Yep. Um, and and from the architectural standpoint, the playground's designed like you would expect to design it for a, a child care facility. So it has the typical fencing and clearance spaces around equipment and all of all of those typical things you see. It's it's really designed for them. And then, as Michael said, in off hours, it's open to the community. So weekends and um, it's primarily weekends, think, Robin, because um, the yeah. child care is going to be open until seven seven thirty at night. Uh, we are lucky that we are across uh, Yesler, which is a busy street, but the signal's right there for people to go and access the playground associated with that school right across the street. Yeah. Yep. Um, huh. What is the average family size served by Skipta? Do you know that? The average family size is, uh, I think in the two and three bedroom unit is about three and a half people per unit. Um, and it depends over time, right? And if I were to look at our whole portfolio, so um, a little bit of a challenge on this is I'm not really sure who's gonna live there. Um, if I look at our bulk of studios and ones, that's one set of stats. If I look at our two and threes, that's another set of stats. Um, so it, it depends, but it's a it's a little bit over three for our two and three bedroom units. I uh, We have a mix of families that are um, multi-generational, which means grandma, grandpa, uh, mom and dad and children. And then uh, on the other side, we have uh, a single parent that may have uh, multiple children or uh, two adult children with kids. So it um, really varies. And, and I might add, it, it, it may be obvious to some, but that maybe not overly obvious, but, but this project really has a whole age spectrum. Um, we have childcare, affordable childcare, the family units, and then of course the AI pace, which is a, the adult day medical and social services. So I would venture to guess that your residents will start to will stay even longer um, here at this this project. Your your averages, our PDA's averages, will even creep up. 
Yeah, for our um, regular non-family size units, the ones that, that have been in existence for longer than uh, the 15 years that my two and three bedroom unit has been, 5% uh, of our population stays over 20 years in those housing units. And I can tell by looking at the building that they tend to be seniors and they get comfortable and the surrounding neighborhood helps, um, really helps them because of transit, because of services, uh, I'll, I'll say it because of food and their families come and visit and all that. And so I think um, we would expect some people to stay in our buildings a really, really long time. And that is really, really helped by having a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly who will provide those services to help them stay in place. Because that is not, I, I'm not good at that. I'm just, that's not what we do. And so um, it is helpful to have somebody else who is much more tied into the healthcare system um, to really work with the seniors to make sure that they're not socially isolated and the care that they need to stay in community is maintained. Yeah, that's great. Um, there's a quick question. Were there any buildings or housing on the space before? And I can answer that one. There, there's a storage shed there currently, but no, no inhabitable buildings, no residence, no office, nothing like that. It's actually largely a parking lot and a, um, it's mostly parking lot and there's a, an old tennis court that's not being maintained and it's chain linked. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, I didn't see the yeah. tennis court. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's strange. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. A uh, question for Andy. EUI can be a challenging metric for affordable housing due to the impact of occupant density. Did the increased focus on family units actually help in achieving the EUI target for the EV program? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, I think it really does get at the heart of the theme of this session, which is, you know, looking beyond that typical per unit count metric. And actually, when we were doing some of our preparations for this session, that kind of um, thread between challenges with normalizing everything to a unit count metric for the funding is you know, really similar to the challenges with reporting energy on a per square foot basis versus, you know, is per bedroom a more appropriate metric or a per person. Um, and, you know, I would say that having the larger units um, is going to naturally have a little bit uh, lower EUI count because you're serving more square footage with just a single appliance package for the cooking, the, you know, the uh, well, we've got mostly shared laundry facilities, but all those typical appliances, you've only got one for two or three bedrooms instead of, you know, studios where you've still got the same, you know, oven and quantity of cooking. Um, but that said, looking at those reduction numbers, um, those were still modeled based on the same occupant density. And so that that piece of the puzzle is still there for the, the site level analysis and optimizing design choices. But um, it is a it is a challenging part of the energy usage intensity as a an energy per square foot metric as opposed to a per bedroom or per person or zooming out and rethinking rethinking that typically used EUI metric. It's it's a really great comment. There's um a an interesting question related to the ERVs and um, it says if each residential unit has a filter in the ERV, who's responsible for maintaining that filter? And it's um, probably a good question for Maiko, but could be an Andy question, I suppose, in terms of access, but. Andy, I think I think it's uh, our staff, and I think they're gonna be quarterly, uh, quarterly maintenance, uh, maintenance and swapping out of the filters. Um, Cause I think um, in thinking about who else is doing this, I think the Seattle Housing Authority is doing it up at Yeser Terrace and that's who we've asked for assistance. That's what I remember. It could be COVID hazy dream, um, but that's what I think it is. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is something that'll be on the uh, the buildings facilities staff to to handle those filter changes. And I will say that you know there's a few different ways to provide these energy recovery ventilators, doing them in each dwelling where now they need to have that access to the units to do those filter changes is one approach that's generally cost effective and that's what was landed on for this project. There are ways to cluster those ERVs and do um, a shared ERV on the corridor that serves a few units or things like that. There are obviously a lot of design considerations and pros and cons to centralizing that and having the um, 
centrally accessible access for maintenance and you know the project did go through some studies to consider those different options but this was the approach that they landed on and it does require the facilities folks to access the units for the filter changes i have to i would add everywhere along the way um you know we're like oh, we, we're not sure we want to do this exemplary building thing and then when joel shows up saying michael we're in the top 10. we're in the we're in the top 10 for most looted sites in the whole damn state and you start thinking about, huh, and you have kids that have grown up in your housing and um, that, that you see them all the time with your kid because they go to school together. Um, you know, if you live in this part of the city, all your kids are probably going to Garfield or Washington and you see them all the time as you're walking around the neighborhood and they're hanging out at the bubble tea and all this. And, and when you start to realize, wow, you could have really messed them up by um, putting them near such bad air. Um, it, is extremely hard not to think about, okay, how hard is it gonna be for us to clean out these air filters? How hard is it gonna to be to do these um, things? And um, uh, I guess uh, being a mission-driven organization, whatever it is that we are, um, it's it's something that you have to figure out how to do. Because if you're sticking your community there, you have to take care of them. Um, that, that segues nicely into this question somebody put up about Will residents have a way to move into units with fewer bedrooms? And I suppose it works in reverse too, into larger bedrooms as family members grow up or you add family members to your family. Uh, yeah, we, we do have transfer policies. What's um, I think what's nice about this is uh, sometimes in, in these limited buildings, like the one that has uh, two and three bedroom units, um, as families grow and shrink, it gets a little hard because uh, they, may not, they may not need a two bedroom anymore. And, uh, or they, you know, it's amazing, uh, you know, a three bedroom unit can hold six, seven, eight people in them. Um, but as family needs change over time, there is flexibility to move between. And um, once you income qualify into the building, um, it, you have ability to move, which is helpful. So we have studios, ones, twos, threes, and fours, I think. Yeah, Joel, there's 30, right? 30, 30 studios, 45 ones. So there, there are the chance to move plus uh, building B phase two will not have as many large units. So there's the chance to move if the income is similar, which probably will be, they can move to another building as well if there's not enough availability in uh, building A. There's a, a couple of questions about parking and transit. And uh, the first one is how much parking are you providing? And I can answer that one. There's 74 stalls total between both buildings. It's not a ton of parking. Um, but this relates up to another question about parking up here or transit in general, or was it? Oh, what are the transit connections? Yeah, go ahead. Maybe 53 only in building A though, just to be clear. Correct, 53, yeah, in building and if A. I, and if I can also um, add, sorry, just so I can add up, uh, out of those 53, only 33 are going for residents. And then we have the balance right. 20 towards uh, the commercial, which is licensed that we have to provide. So, okay, Correct. Ahead. Yep. So yeah, it's not a, much. Yes. It's not a ton. <laughs> it's not a ton. Um, I can, um, I can fill in Michael's to... question too okay. about the transit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Michael, here. we're on uh, the 36. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Can you read it to the audience so they so can the, see it? What are the transit here? connections like at this site? Is there coordination occurring with Metro and the city to improve multimodal connections to the site? Um, it's on the 36, and the 36 is an emergency snow route, and living further up the hill on the 36, it is a very predictable and frequent bus, regardless of snow, of all those things. It's also on the 60, you are uh, half a mile away from the streetcar stop that then takes you to the light rail station, which is a mile away from there. So the site is located a mile between, and you can either go down to the International District Station, which is the largest transportation hub north of San Francisco, west of the Mississippi, or you can go up to the Beacon Hill traffic uh, transit stop. So um, those two are there. Um, there is some multimodal connections happening. There's, uh, and it's a bit of an issue because it's getting a little congested around there. There's bikes, there's, uh, there's bike paths and there's walking, but it is really trying to figure out how that how this fits best in there um, for that. And um, the other thing about parking is there's a large parking structure at the site already. 
uh, that the Department of Commerce leases the whole thing out at, and that parking structure is never full. So if uh, families need to, and it's not a very expensive parking lot. So if uh, we've been trying to talk to them about getting some sort of parking system going on there. Yep, there is, to Michael's point, uh, parking nearby that's underutilized. Yeah. Um, let's see, do you put the access in your lease as a rider? I think this is talking about the ERV and the filter access. Um, I wonder since that filter cleaning is really important for it working efficiently and effectively, if they are in the units, is this a choice that's been made to be central or in a unit? It, we have made the choice, they are in the units. Um, instead of kind of a centralized, but to Andy's point, we did do quite a bit of study. And at one point we were moving forward with centralized and not in the units. Um, and we eventually made the switch for a variety of reasons. Um, we, we are a little limited on our height of our building overall. And so one of those decision points was being able to maintain adequate floor to floor or ceiling height, clear height within the units themselves and going to a per unit gave us better ability to do that. Whereas the centralized, you're talking a lot, a lot more ducts running through the corridors and in and out of units and things like that. Um, but I guess the underlying question is, is that in the lease that they're allowed to come in and access? And I imagine it is, but. It hasn't I'll been ask. drafted yet in the lease, Robin, but I think we have to, right? In order to maintain the health benefits required that they're gonna have to let us in the unit. Um, we don't have many residents that don't allow us access to their to their unit unless it's uh, a bed bug dog or something of that nature. So trying to work that out, yeah. Um, do you envision our tenant elders interacting with the childcare uh, AI pace and filling the need for social connection? And I know this is something that has been talked about. Does anybody wanna elaborate between any conversations with AI pace or El Centro in the past about seniors and children interacting? I don't think we've had, well, more of a micro question, but we, I don't think we've had any official discussions there. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of studies of where it's really beneficial for both, not one or the other. And so I think there's gonna be some natural interaction because the open area where, where elders can, whether they live there or the AI pace folks can come sit down and be right outside the, the gated play area. There'll be some some minor interaction. Anything beyond that, we have not really officially done anything. And Michael, I don't know if there was any thought um, to do that. I don't think we've really broached that. On a, I, I have not broached that. And Sai, you'll remember at I think you remember at Village Square too. That was the intent with our assisted living facility in the child care next door. And uh, due to the project managers lack of ability to deal with water penetration, which was not anybody on this design team. Um, we had to swap out some windows and everything. I think that is the intent though, right? Of everybody, because um, I don't think isolating one group from another is, uh, is how people have naturally lived. And um, this whole idea of, of um, I don't, we always have a lot of seniors living in our housing, regardless of whether they're family units or not. And so it's just natural for seniors to be around our community, especially as I head into that direction of age. I'm like, yeah, of course I'm gonna be all over the place and interacting with people. It's, it's a healthy way to live. It's how, you know, and it's, it's the way that our community chooses to live. I, I do know in the design process at some point, there was a lot of anecdotal um, information that came up about the benefit of the interaction and, um, in other locations where there are both senior facilities and childcare facilities that uh, the seniors tend to gravitate to where they can watch the play space because it's, it's something engaging and exciting to watch and listen to. And because of that, the seniors, the AI Pace facility has a, an outside deck and it actually does over kind of overlook the play space so that there is a really great visual connection between the two, as well as um, to Joel's point, if they really went outside and down to the the amenity space, they'd be able to be right there. Um, let's see here. Are you able to provide housing to childcare workers and their families who may qualify within the income limits? What we would do is affirmatively market to uh, the people that are 
both working and probably bringing their children to the child care center as well as the AI Pace Center for those uh, that want to live in the property. They don't, they don't necessarily have a priority to or we don't set aside units for, but they would as um, would uh, the other people we would definitely market to are the people that are attending the uh, medical center either as patients or workers at the uh, Pacific Medical Center across the way and all, all the people around the campus, right? Um, so it would be working with our partners at both of those programs in particular, the AI PACE program and El Centro to help us market the units for their clientele and their employees. Yeah. yeah. Um, was there a decision to forego market rate units funding or was the decision to forego market rate units a funding rate with related decision? So related to building A, uh, building A was always gonna be affordable. Um, building B, as along the way, the uh, land went, went from a lease to a sale to us. It was a public, public development authority to a public development authority sale. And as a condition of the sale, we are extremely limited in the number of market rate units that can be um, developed on site. And that is a, that's a requirement of the sale. So we don't, we, we have a sense of what could be built on building uh, for building B, but we haven't figured out to that level of detail yet. Joel, am I correct on that? That is, that is my yeah, and I fuzzy think COVID her, presumption. Yeah, and before even Skip that came in, it was, I think I mentioned early on, it was gonna be building B was gonna be market rate. Building A was affordable. So it was gonna be all market rate, but um, uh, the Speaker of the House uh, decided that it, it needed to stay. Um, well, he didn't want it to at least the land being owned by a, a, a for profit, I guess is, is the easiest way of saying that. So um, right now we are trying to figure out building B, but it's not going to be all, all market rate. And it won't be. No, I think the PHPDA land requirement was that it can't be. Yeah, it, it's um, and it's written into our master use permit currently as well. Um, building A is 50% of the units will be 50% AMI or less, and 50% of the units will be 60% AMI or less. Um, building B at minimum is 80% of the units will be 80% AMI or less. Um, so to their point, only a very small portion is even eligible to be market rate, but um, the intention is, is to lean towards the affordable. Um, is your preschool a Seattle preschool program so that children will get free preschool? And would you share whether this is a condo structure at, and at what point you plan to declare the condo before TCO or before the start of construction? Joel. Um, you know, I don't know that El Centro, so first the structure is the PDA is going to own uh, the residential portion above the 160. The child care is 10,000 square feet. The PDA is also going to own that, but their long-term tenant will be El Centro and they're running it. So I don't know, Robin, if it's a Seattle preschool program. I can follow up on that and get to you uh, with that. I, I don't know, we can ask. I don't, think they, I don't think they'd like to do the Seattle preschool program, honestly. I, I don't know. Honestly, we, we, we can check. Yeah. And uh, so that will not be condo per se for two legal owners, but the AI PACE, since you're asking the question, AI PACE is going to be condo and they're going to own their space. So the AI PACE is owning their space. Um, and so that maybe answers a little beyond what you're looking, looking for. But Robin, the, um, the, the child care is going to benefit, it's, it's a community service facility. For tax credit purposes. For tax credit purposes. So the, so the tax credit partnership will, you know, own and operate both, so to speak. Yes. Uh, we have a question that presumably you will be getting some residents exiting out of homelessness. Will you be providing services for those in need? We have a resident services program that we're developing. 
but it is not robust yet. And that is not a high portion of the population that uh, we plan to serve. We're wanting to target more of the people that are currently being displaced off of Beacon Hill and, and the Chinatown ID in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, some of the questions are sent kind of privately in the in the chat, and so I don't know that everybody can see them. But can there's another one about uh, what type of partnerships and teams were brought together and at what point in the project to make it happen. So maybe when we were brought into the deal, we were uh, we had been working with AI Pace since 2011, had been part of AI PACE and had been discussing things with AI PACE since about 2010, 2011 on the need for a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. Um, when uh, the site was made available to them, we were part of that. Now, Centro was already there. And as the PHPDA started exploring their options as to what they could and could not do on the site, um, being a similar entity to them afforded some opportunities for them on what they wanted to do, right? And then um, the uh, Weber Thompson architect team was already involved on the project. And then uh, along the way, the other people started falling into place as we started figuring out what we needed. Um, I needed a development consultant pretty quickly who could understand and be willing to work with our community and our, our needs and deal with my crazy insistence on having family housing. And there were many fights and yelling with Joel about, he's like, but if we do this, we'll be able to do this and it'll make us look better. And I'm like, we're not gonna do that yet, right? And so, um, and it was just as data started coming in, it's like, nope, we need this for help. Nope, we will, nope, nope, we need this kind of help. How do we figure this out? So. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but part of the team was already there. Part of it was driven by the person who actually sold us the land, right? Because what they wanted to see. I, th that touches on another question I've gotten. Um, it says, you've mentioned that, or you've mentioned all the air pollution in this part of the city. How did Skip to the land on this site for development? What made you decide this location was the right fit? Uh, you sort of answered, but. <laughs> um, you know, it's really, really hard to buy land in Chinatown, in the Chinatown ID right now. Um, uh, this neighborhood has land that's selling. And if you work in other parts of the city, it may not be that expensive for you. But for us, uh, land transactions are happening quickly and they're very, very expensive. And so having somebody who was willing to do, let's call it an off-market deal, a PDA to PDA transaction, that was uh, extremely um, helpful for us. Um, helping meet our mission through the other components of having the childcare and the other entities at play, which we had already been working with for years was extremely helpful. Um, I work in this neighborhood and the air quality there is as bad as it is here. And uh, I guess you don't really think about how bad the air is until it's presented to you. And we own a lot of units here. And uh, actually I don't live that far away from the site. And so I guess I personally made a decision to live there as well. So um, once you know that you kind of have to figure out the other elements. It is a great site. You are close in to Beacon Hill International School to really good uh, other uh, education opportunities. You are on transit, you're close into work. You're close into a community that has a lot of different supports for you in language. Um, you have to figure out how to mitigate the other part of it. And I still believe it's an excellent site. We've, we've got um, another financing question. In terms of financing, projects often face pressure to create high unit counts and therefore small units. Um, We've touched on this uh, actually very similarly at the beginning. Um, but kind of what were the roadblocks to funding? Could you elaborate on, on those roadblocks to funding that you wish you could remove in the future? You want me to go, Michael? Yeah. Um, 
you know, I don't know if there's any funding we would look to remove. I, I think for those who develop here in the state, here in the city, um, our method of funding was not really any different. We started local, went to the city, went to the county, and went to the state, and then we have tax code. So it's, it's not as though our project did anything different. I think what we had to do when it's run, uh, funding roadblocks, for those who know that the 4% tax credit project right now is, is really a difficult, difficult um, process. It just is. There's just too many projects, uh, affordable, too many affordable projects from both the traditional nonprofits versus the not versus and the market rate providers. So that is a difficult thing. I will say this is all public. So um, we didn't get funded. We didn't get funded in January. Um, the Finance Commission did make PDAs now getting direct allocation. So uh, skip the community routes and any other PDA that mission is affordable housing can go directly. So that was extremely fortunate for us. We're not going to mince that. It, it was, it made a difference. We were, I will say we're right on the cusp. And as much as we've been explaining what we're doing from a mission standpoint, we actually already had these for those, this is in the weeds, but the license, we had licensed commercial projects already in our project. And then pre-January, the finance commission made that extra points. So, you know, I don't know if I'm directly answering your question, but one thing I will say is when we first went to the funders, then they knew the project already. And when I say the funders, it's, it's the city, county and the state, they knew the project. We didn't get funded the first time. I think I said that earlier. And we kind of felt like, okay, it's gonna to be tough just like all the other projects. But the second time we came back, Mike and I kind of laugh about this. There was more excitement about it. And, and I don't know what changed, but we heard it on numerous fronts that there, people were actually encouraging us to come in to fund, which often doesn't happen. And so uh, again, we feel fortunate. I think again, the location is, as Michael said, it's really important uh, or it's a great location. And, and I think the public and the community is gonna be served well by this project. I, I would, uh, the only thing I would add to that is that the city of Seattle has now made family units a priority. Um, so, uh, which is good. They're just one of the funders, which was great. But I do think um, a, a four bedroom is gonna cost way more than a studio and trying to, sorry, side with Marpac, you're not gonna like this, but trying to get a contractor to price out what a bunch of four bedroom units cost like, you know, it, it's hard for them because they don't really know. And you're like, well, should we look at it as, as, as a studio and add on this, right? I mean, it, it, it becomes part of a, a challenge to even price out what some of this looks like because there aren't a lot of examples. Um, so I do. I don't want to be the. I don't want to be the only person known for doing this work in city. I think we should all kind of be looking at it. And so it was extremely helpful having the city come forward and saying that that is a priority for them. Um, Robin, we're not funding eighty percent units. I can build eighty percent units for my land use covenant, but I am not building them yet. So, uh, and I'm not sure if that's really what my uh, board will want to do. So. Um, to answer Robin's question. That's, I see that right there in the chat. But um, yeah, I do think having the city start acknowledging that there's families that want to live in the city and we can't necessarily all live in single family houses and they're not all going to be lo in locations that work for everybody um, for whatever reason, um, I think is an important acknowledgement and was helpful. We're, uh, we're getting a little close on time. Um... If there's a quick answer, Aaron Swain's asked a question, apologies if you've already addressed this. Um, does the EDP look like a tool that will work for a, uh, work to award funding for great projects like this? EDP. Aaron, do you mean the exemplary building program, EBT, <laughs> by chance? I'm drawing. I was like the equitable development. See that that's, you think EB is like, 
whatever building and I'm like equitable, <laughs> right. equitable development, <laughs> oh, whatever. Oh, the equitable development funding for this? No, 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 I no, think no. Aaron, no, Aaron's talking about something environmental here. EBT. He's, ta he's talking about the, uh, the exemplary building program. Buildings program. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Look like a, a tool that will, I guess, help to award funding for projects like this. Um, I, I guess to uh, did participating in that attract funding, and um, and and did that weigh into how the funding happened? You know. Um, I'm gonna say we had a meeting because we thought we were going down one track and the funder was like, I don't know if you wanna be coming to us for this pot of money because uh, your requirements would be that much higher. Why are you not applying to the housing trust fund? Uh, that was the one meeting I think Joel referenced where we had a funder that was really excited to talk to us, which uh, I've never been in a room where a funder is like, no, please come to me and ask me for this because um, I think what was helpful was how crappy the air was, you know, like, ooh, I'm in the top 10. Nobody really wants to be on that top 10 list. Um, and that was helpful, but it was helpful to have the funder say, I don't think you should go to this higher standard because it will cost you, Joel, from my recollection, that's what it was. It's gonna to be too much for you to go for this. And you don't really need that to meet what you want. Yeah, they actually steered us clear. When we when we look at exemplary building, we're looking at all these other areas, um, they did steer us away from it, uh, which was very helpful. And again, it was, we tried to really stay away from really chasing too much criteria as much as we're all, we're all guilty of it. Um, it it's just a fact. Uh, we try to stick to what we think makes the most sense. I can't build something that my maintenance staff can't maintain. And that is too crazy expensive to be able to provide it affordable in an affordable housing project, right? That is also another underlying presumption that I always have to have with a lot of my stuff. Like, hey, is this something I can actually maintain? Because um, if I can't, we got to go figure something else out. Yeah, so saying all that, I think what we, what we would like in, in our presentation is in five years, 10 years to, to have some proven data. I mean, hopefully we can say, the residents are, you know, X percent are still here. You know, the stuff Andy was saying and, and what Weber Thompson is building, you know, I, you know, I don't know how you actually measure that, Andy. Is there a way we can measure if what we're putting in is actually helping? I mean, how, how do we do this? So we have that for, for others. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just chime in that there is a, um, you know, SCL is providing some incentives for compliance with this 20 EUI target. That number comes from the SCL funding mechanism. And they have some additional money for a post-occupancy performance period where SCL will take the utility bills, um, aggregate data to verify if the project is achieving that 20 energy usage intensity EUI number. And there's a little extra money on top if you meet the, so they, you know, they want to, they want to front load that incentive to encourage the design strategies. And then there's a little extra if you meet the target, they don't want to discourage folks and make it to seem too challenging or too high stakes if you miss that target, but there's a little money, extra money available and there is a post occupancy performance period aspect. Yeah, thanks for that. We do have a little bit of city of Seattle, Seattle City Light funding in here that we budgeted to what Andy is referring to. Um, we're we're basically out of time, but one last question for everybody right before we we leave. Um, what have you learned from this project, and what could be implemented on future projects in a more streamlined way? So, kind of, what is your big takeaway from what we've gone through so far, and what would you want to see moving forward based on what we've done here? Joe, go first. <laughs> well, you know, I think, I think what, um, I think we will hope, and I think Andy can help, you know, when we're doing this exemplary building, we're one of the few affordable projects to do this. So hopefully we will have lessons learned on, and hopefully we will have data on what, what could be done, maybe perhaps more efficiently, or what really works, either way, to go both ways. So I, I hope that not only helps us, but helps the industry. That's what we're all in here for. 
Um, I would say the other thing is I, I see a big push for these big projects to have light uh, mission oriented commercial ground floor, whether it's Robin was mentioning child care, we have two, but that's kind of a big push now. And that's, that makes a lot of sense for, for obvious reasons, all these other public resources. I would say you can't underestimate meeting with them early and often because it is a lot of different layers. Maggie can attest to this and, and the rest of the team on from a design aspect, you know, you're, you're not always moving in tandem. And then so to come back and try to, to change that's from a design aspect. There's certainly a lot of financing issues related. So the short answer is on that is just get in early and keep meeting with them and keep talking with them. Yeah, I, I would 100% echo that from a, a um, not even necessarily from the commercial down, you know, who's on your first floor standpoint, but in terms of the EV program, um, we're, that's MEP is design build. And I think we could have brought them on even earlier. Uh, Andy's chart that she showed where you've got those two curves and you're just moving the effort earlier on. I, I think it's, um, it's really accurate. And the earlier you can get those other consultants engaged, the better you can space plan and all sorts of things. Um, I, I think that would be a big takeaway. I, I think the other one for me is one of the things we've enjoyed is how well Skip It knows their community and that the better you know your community and what your community needs, the, the more easily you can meet those needs because you're not designing for a totally ambiguous sect of people, you're designing for people that you know and understand. And I, I think that makes a difference too. Andy or Michael, anything to Andy, add? Go Andy. Uh, well, Meg, you kind of hit on what I was gonna mention, which is again, just really that importance of early integrative design, getting the right people at the table at the right time to like, you know, when we were just talking about the ERV and there's different ways to do that, whether it's per dwelling unit, those, you know, lumped together per floor centralized versus rooftop, there's a lot of pros and cons and there's a lot of design and cost impacts and, you know, evaluating those different strategies and what are the priorities of the project. So I would say having clear goals and vision and having people at the table providing that input early on is a, a really important key to success. I, just I, I should that. say marpac has been a part of that this yeah. process and they've been yeah. they've been essential to those questions of well what is the cost difference between building these two, you know, building this way or that way. That's been really important along this way. I would add that I should not be the decision maker on most of the stuff. So when things come up, like Andy's like, do we want to do it this way or this way? Uh, it's not my decision. It's like asking the maintenance guys, dudes, what, 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 you know, this, these are the options. What do you think is going to work and how are we going to do this? And um, the property ops guys are the guys that are really the ones that are more important on making the decisions because um, you know, they, they know how our residents live and they are members of the community themselves. And, they, you know, it's like their, their moms live in the units, their, you know, their cousins, some of them live in the units as well. So it is like, what's going to work for us, right? Because I, I, I don't know anything. I can't even name the building. I'm not, I, I'm not even qualified to do that <laughs> or choose the paint colors, but it is like, Kenny, what's, what's this going to look like? How are we going to do this? Yeah, we can do it. Okay, good. Right. Um, because they're really the ones. And the people are gonna, my initial move-ins are gonna live in there after I'm gone. So, you know, how do you get that in, into it? Well, thanks everybody. Um, we're a little over time, so I think we probably ought to cut Sorry. ourselves off, but thank you so much for joining us. We've really enjoyed being here and thanks for the great questions and um, hope everybody's excited about family affordable housing. <laughs> Uh, Emma, anything we should conclude with from HDC or um, is HDC planning to post the recording if anybody wants to come back to it? Yeah, we'll be posting and Bye, sharing, Tori. <laughs> we'll be sharing the, the recording on the Affordable Housing Week page. So that'll be up in like probably like 24 hours. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thanks for spending Monday afternoon with us. Thanks, everyone.